<laughs> we try. Well, here we are. Brett, I'm excited to dive in. Uh, you're the founder of Launch House. Why don't we kick it off with what is Launch House trying to accomplish in the world? Uh, that's a great question. Um, first of all, excited to be here. Uh, super happy to be sharing this, uh, sharing this with the world. Um, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, we're a community for founders, builders, more broadly, people who are just trying to build the future. Um, and I would say what we're trying to accomplish, um, and I, actually this is the first time I'm articulating this publicly. We just had a, a, a team retreat uh, where we articulated this. Um, basically the context is this epidemic and loneliness. Um, organized religion is basically on the, de on the, de the decline. People aren't getting community from w work anymore. There's no office people because people are working remotely obviously causing all these these problems in society and the, and the the solution is community. And so one of the thoughts is, while we can't give community to every human on earth, uh, <laughs> probably no company can, uh, we can give it to people who have an outsized impact on other humans on earth. Uh, and so the idea is that if you give community to founders, engineers, people building these companies that impact the lives of millions and billions of people, and you, you make them compassionate and whole people, then they will build compassionate and whole companies, which makes the users and the people who are affected by those companies more compassionate and whole. So mm. I'd say broadly, right. that's the mission of Launch House. But yeah. you know, more simply, we just want to vibe with cool people. Yeah, no, I like <laughs> it. What, what is the impact of the decline in religion? How does that merge into it? Because I, I, I see a few different trends happening that certainly being a major one from a macro trend also in the internet and covid so maybe more people are working remotely and you know in their spare bedroom are those are, are do those kind of intertwined together do you see how do you see yeah. those two totally so the need to belong is basically the most fundamental human need beyond physical sustenance right beyond eating drinking and sleeping right the need to belong is basically the most fundamental human need. They've done studies and they found that like mental illness is tied to a lack of this feeling of belonging. Uh, physical illness even is, is tied to this lack of this feeling of belonging. Uh, and, so, and so the idea is that like uh, due to all of these factors you mentioned, humans are not getting that need to belong fulfilled. So organized religion, right? the ultimate feeling of belongingness, right? Not only do you, not only do you connect with other human beings, but you connect with them on a deeper spiritual level. Like that's what, that's, what's amazing about Christianity, Judaism, Islam, all these religions is that you form these intimate, incredibly deep connections, uh, that last a lifetime, you know, and beyond. Uh, and what's unfortunate right now is that the atheists threw the baby out with the bathwater. They basically said, you know, and this is my parents' generation, uh, um, I would say, probably even our generation as well. They said, organized religion is BS. All religion sucks. It's all wrong. Uh, whatever. Well, the, the really hilarious thing about that is that organized religion has kind of like undergone the same pressures as, uh, as any sort of organism through evolutionary, you know, natural selection. Like it's survived thousands of years for a reason because it has incredible product market fit with like human beings, human psychology and all this stuff because it f f fulfills this need to belong. So as organized religion declined, you saw a lot of people turning to their offices, right? You see a lot of office, you know, uh, corporate cultures emerging into these kind of like way beyond like, Hey, we make widgets and we, you know, we're here to make widgets into being like, Hey, we're, you know, we're here, you know, to help people feel this sense of mission and purpose. And all these things that organized religion uh, was meant to do, remote work, plus like the decline of like the average you know tenure in a individual company has basically er eroded this. Also, at the same time, obviously you see this rise in political polarization and activism. It's no, it's no, yeah, right? It's it's no coincidence because organized religion is on decline. Obvious culture, you got to turn somewhere. You got to find identity and culture and community somewhere. And obviously that's caused a ton of problems. You have Trump, you have ISIS, you have all these terrible, crazy things in the world. And it all comes down to 
this lack of the need, the feeling of belonging. And so that's the context for everything. The CDC has said that uh, there's a loneliness epidemic, like there's an epidemic in loneliness. And a lot of companies are, tr are responding to this, like Clubhouse during the pandemic absolutely exploded because they created it. They were a platform for people to feel belonging, right? In a world where nobody felt belonging, right? All these online communities exploded during the pandemic because people didn't have this sense of belonging anymore. Just because the pandemic is mostly over doesn't mean it's good, that 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 lack of the feeling is is fulfilled. Um, it just it just means that it's different now, and so yeah, you can see that yeah. So that's that's the kind of the, the backdrop for everything. I, I kind of I feel like uh, you must listen to Jordan Peterson because he has a lot of the same theories on the influence of religion and throwing the throwing the baby out with the bathwater in particular. I feel like there's kind of uh, multiple layers to this. One is the the kind of secular feeling of contributing to your society. You know, we say we go on a camping trip and there's 50 people on the camping trip. Uh, I want to feel like I'm helpful to the group for for this not religious feeling or not 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 anything other than the the connection between each individual person in the group. So I, you know, no one likes to feel like the uh, the drag or the freeloader. It's a, yeah. th th there's a certain like emotional negativity to that. And then yeah. there's the, the inverse, the positive feeling, which I'm productive, I'm purposeful, I'm useful to society and people are showing me love for it. I'm getting attention, I'm getting money, I'm getting, you know, acclimation or just even the feeling of having done something useful. I, I think that I, I parse that out separately from religion. I, I feel the, the useful part of religion is the explanation as to what are we doing floating on this rock in the middle of nowhere in a yeah. you know, mild sized uh, galaxy. And, and yeah. it, it, it tries like science, I think was the attempt to explain, to replace it. You know, we're, we're going to yeah. collect data. We're going to collect so much data that that's going to tell us a story. And there's, there's a, there's a large truth to the, the understanding you can get from it, but it doesn't go beyond the data you collect. And, I feel largely, I, this is my personal view on it, is that the Western world tends to look very outwardly. You know, we have telescopes, we have microscopes, we look really far, really big, really small. Uh, the, the Eastern world, say India in particular, with their traditions look inwardly for a long, long time. Um, mm -hmm. Things like contemplative meditation, Zog Chen Zen, these, these are uh, like internal telescopes. And I, I think that the world is really collapsing on these two together. You know, our, the technology of the West is merging over to the East and vice versa. And uh, it is, I think, emerging a new sort of like neo, uh, like more people identify with being spiritual today than ever before, but mm -hmm. not religious. And I think that's probably more like a evolution as opposed to a regression in the like domain of existentialism or spirituality, whatever you want to label it as. Um, yeah, I kind of yeah. look at, I look at what you guys are doing as, as fulfilling the, the gap in community, which isn't necessarily, uh, it was largely filled by religion because the world, the world was so religious. I mean, prior to the United States forming, even with the U S like the entire world was ruled by the Catholic church, Protestant, um, yeah. you know, religions effectively controlled the game. So, yeah, I mean, like, a lot of these things, I mean, there's so many interesting thoughts there. Uh, a lot of these thinkers have, 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 I forgot who it is, but they said that religion was an invention to organize humanity once it exceeded Dar Dunbar's number, right? And really that Dunbar's number, that 150 is like, you know, Dunbar's number is this idea that like humans can only kind of like have genuine connection with 150 people, which is like basically the upper bound for a tribe or something like that or it is, you know, a, a small town or something like that. Um, once you get beyond that, you, f you have internal conflict. And what is internal conflict driven by? It's driven by two people fighting over the same, uh, you know, identity within that tribe, within that group, right? That's all conflict is. And so what I think is, hap what I think is happening in the world is the internet has made it, it abundantly clear that there are millions of people just like you and me in the world. There's so many podcasters. There's so many founders. There's so many community builders. There, right? There's so many like 
white Jewish man. There's so many like people like dating apps. Look, look how many options there are. Look how many options my my prospective partner has. And so the idea is that whenever there's somebody who can compete directly with us for our role in society, then our need to belong is threatened. Right. Our need to, our, our sense of belonging is threatened. If I'm the only one who can do the thing that I do for my community or for my society, I'm the only doctor in the, in the community or I'm the only carpenter or whatever in my small hundred person town, I'm happy, I'm safe, I'm never going to, I'm never going to worry. But what happened when humanity had these, like, you know, reached these larger numbers, you had a bunch of competition. So you needed to create um, rule of law, you needed to create identity and morality to basically align incentives and get people to cooperate. Hey, we're all Christians. You know, one carpenter is, 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 isn't, you know, different from another. We're all Christians here. Whereas before you could say, I'm the carpenter in the, in the town mm. or I'm the doctor in the town. And so I'm, I'm safe and I'm, I'm good to go. And this happens literally. I worked at Google. This happens at Google too. We're like, you know, as soon as you have two PMs that don't have clear swim lanes, clear, like areas of responsibility, they get sad, they get angry, they get fearful for their jobs. And so that's literally the fundamental, <laughs> fundamental thing that religion solved was it said, don't worry about your identity. You're all Christians. We're good. We're good. Jesus loves you. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. 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 You'll have a place here regardless. It's kind of interesting if you, if you parallel that to the online digital world, so much of who we are is represented digitally exclusively. You know, you, if you lose your digital account, then I'm sure many people, especially if you're earning your primary income from, you know, revenue streams on like Instagram or YouTube or whatever it is, then you're, you're, so dependent on that if you were to lose that who would you be what would you be left with and if you're you know nine if you're 90 95 percent identified with your online presence your productivity your contribution online how, how does that shift the um how does that change the feeling of connectedness to other people like take the same example of the carpenter if you're now making you know take take this podcast example we focus on startups, uh, crypto, you know, early stage, cool pro pro projects like Launch House, but we're niched, you know, I'm not doing everything in the world, but it's online only, you know, I'm, we're not meeting in a community coffee house where it's a local presence. Uh, so if there's a, if there's an overlap, like you say, the conflict, there's enough space digitally where it's oh i almost view it as like infinite space it's like it you know you just you could just open up another parcel and and be more specialized because there's more people to jump in and listen to what you're saying or watch what you're producing totally i i, I mean do you have a reaction to the idea of the trappings of of digital contribution the obsession certainly i think it's quite mainstream now the trappings of like hey if you're only obsessed with your influencer pro portfolio, your you know Instagram, your TikTok, then there's a um, a feeling of narcissism. Uh, anxiety starts to build. I think these are pretty well correlated at this point, right? People who are yeah. experiencing depression might have more successful <laughs> like Instagram or TikTok accounts. Um, yeah, yeah. How, how do you take? How do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like a. <laughs> Social media activity sometimes is an expression of a need of a lack of a need to belong, you could argue, right? Or lack of feeling of belongingness, right? So like, um, you know, just think of one, an example of some, some person who is not getting fulfillment in their physical setting. This happens a lot in like in, you know, tech circles where a lot of people grow up in random cities and towns where they're the smartest kid in the town. And, uh, you know, Jack, you know, Jack Dorsey over here grew up in the Midwest, probably the smartest kid in the town, Larry Page, same, same deal. And where do they turn? Well, maybe they didn't have as many friends at school because they, you know, they were smarter than everybody or they had different interests and stuff. And so they turn to communities online for their kind of fulfillment and stuff. And so on one side, it does actually create an incredible sense of belongingness and purpose, right? The internet allows you to connect to people who are just like you anywhere in the world, right? I have a deep connection with people I know from, from Twitter 
uh, of course it's, of course it's a double-edged sword and it's addicting and, and like, you know, there's a lot of like negativity and, and terrible stuff on Twitter, but I, I would honestly just look at it like, like there's terrible stuff happening, you know, in the real yeah. world too. Yeah. Yeah. Do, so, do, you, yeah. Do, you, do you take Launch House and say, because uh, Launch House started in person exclusively, right? I think you, you guys were renting out uh, houses, large houses, and bringing a bunch of influencers together. Do you see that as the continued model where you're focusing on the in person community, or is it shifting to some hybrid or exclusively digital? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So, but TLDR, so right now, Launch House, so Launch House started. We had a, rented a house in Tulum, put like 19 entrepreneurs in it. Uh, <clears throat> it went well. We had a tweet that went viral about it. Um, people thought it was a reality show. We thought it was a reality show. And we uh, got a second house and we filmed a sizzle reel for this reality show. Um, and, you know, we, we moved to LA. We got a house in LA, this beautiful mansion that Paris Hilton used to live in. And we still thought we were building a reality show, but r right around the time when we were, you know, pitching this thing around, uh, we just experienced some just magical moments in this IRL experience. Um, and we, we realized that kind of joke was on us because several of the companies in the first two houses and three houses raised from, you know, the best venture capital firms in the world, you know, A16Z, Sequoia, YC, Paradigm, all that stuff. And a lot of people walked away with like, you know, lifelong friendships, you know, a lot of those people still hang out today. Um, and so when you think about what's the point of life, it's like success and happiness, <laughs> you know, success, we live, you know, success, happiness and health, you know, to say that you're solving for the two out of the three is pretty unbelievable um, in a meaningful way, or to, actually they have your, your customers, your users tell you you're solving for those, those two, you know, is pretty unbelievable. Um, and IRL is an important reason, reason for that. There is an important component. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are all these psychological studies, proximity, there's all these studies on dorms. So they found that like, you know, people are more likely to like form, become best friends with their neighbors in their dorm than like somebody down the hall who has more similar interests. Um, <laughs> there was this, yeah. one of the, one of the, you know, longer backstories of, you know, where, uh, like launch house originated from is I was like traveling around the world for nine months, you know, going to really exotic places and wound up visiting a bunch of, you know, religious sites and stuff accidentally. But one of the places I wound up was like Ulan Batar in Mongolia. And I was like staying with these nomads. And, uh, I noticed that there were two, these like two cows that they tied together around the neck and, I was asking the translator, I was like, what the heck? Why are you, why'd you guys tie these cows together? They hate each other. They literally hated each other. They were like fighting, mooing. It was just, you know, they're making a lot of commotion. And they're like, we just bought that other cow and we need to integrate it. And I was like, how, this is, seems like the worst idea to integrate <laughs> cow because they look, they literally look like they hate each other. So he's like, just wait. So like six or seven hours later, they'd already been tied together for a little bit of time. They take the, the rope off and these two cows are inseparable. They're like best friends. What? Really? They hated, yeah. They hated each other. And then they literally spend the next couple of days together. And if you think about it, it makes a ton of sense. Proximity, shared struggle, like all these fundamentals of religion, of community, of, you know, the human experience <laughs> of organic life form experience. It's what brings people and animals together. That's what was at play there. You know, we don't tie people around. So I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask you, is that what you guys <laughs> do at launch out? No, yeah, we don't, we don't tie people around the neck, but they live together. They're like, they're like, they're like yeah. together in this yeah. house for a month. It's a great, it's, it's like the opposite of a, 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 you know, getting tied around the neck. You're living in this mansion in Beverly Hills or a mansion in New York city. You're surrounded by the smartest people you've ever you've been ever been surrounded by in your life for most people, um, and you're getting exposed to all these incredible speakers and you know tech industry 
celebrities and normal ce celebrities even coming through. Uh, so it does create that it does create that bonding. It does create that you know experience where you can truly you know be creative and come up with great ideas uh, and all that stuff. But the IRL is is an important component. It will it will always be kind of the the deepest most important way that our community interacts. Uh, but we are going to be going digital. We are we are we are launching a metaverse location, uh, but we're using a lot of the principles behind what makes us successful, what makes an IRL experience successful in in our digital program. Where do you where do you go with the metaverse? So is it clear? Is that roadmap clear at this point, or is it just kind of tentative? Is thinking about launching a metaverse location. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty simple. So. We are, we basically are a distributed community. Um, we have a location in LA, we have a location in New York. It's a physical, it's a house that we have people hanging out, working in, and we have events in both locations. Obviously we're gonna go to more cities than that. You know, SF will probably happen, Miami will probably happen, London, Berlin, you know, Singapore, you, you, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. The metaverse is just another location. Just like I was telling you earlier, me and my friend Nir identified and connected in a way, in a similar way that he and this guy Chris did because they, he and Chris were both British, me and Nir were both from Twitter. The metaverse is just a location. And so the idea is that, that that's just the strategy. The yes, strategy mm -hmm. is treat, treat the metaverse like an equal location. Yeah, people from Texas don't get along with people from LA. That's fine. But like, or, you know, maybe probably more like Georgia or Mississippi or something, right? But the idea is that these are, these are just their own places, their own, their own people, their own sub communities. The metaverse will be one of the, one of the places that we offer. Mm -hmm. uh, over, t over time, obviously, as maybe the, as the internet grows, as the metaverse grows, you could potentially see a world where like, you know, this becomes the new America where, you know, where more, more and more people are settling in, in these kind of metaverse based, you know, cities, uh, that we're building because we're, we're just starting with the house. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we'll see. It's still early. Yeah. And is there a place, I mean, where, where do you tactically go to create a metaverse, uh, address? Are you so, yeah. So, so metaverse is kind of a loaded term right now. And honestly, I think it just means digital. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's a digital place. Um, historically we've had very low fidelity metaverse metaverses. Twitter is part of the metaverse in my mind, right? It's low fidelity cause it's text-based, right? Instagram, a little higher fidelity, you know, TikTok a little higher fidelity, but what matters is it needs to, it needs to resemble and simulate reality. And so that's where like Decentraland and these other kind of like more 3D, you know, uh, you know, immersive um, metaverse locations emerge. But just like with te technology where you started with the printing press and the, you know, uh, photos and then video, just same thing on the internet. You had Twitter, which is text, you know, Instagram, which is photo, TikTok, which is video. Technology progresses, progresses at a, at a, a in a standard pattern, standard format. Um, and that's going to be true for massively multiplayer social experiences online. And so we're, what our intention is, is to be wherever, you know, mass adoption is happening in our, in our, in our community. Mm. So, you know, Decentraland, these more high, high fidelity, uh, you know, experiences are definitely on our list, but right now we're, um, going to be using a product called gather town which is more 2d it looks like a pokemon what's it called Ga gather town gather gather dot town oh cool it looks like a yeah it looks like a it looks like a game boy game pokemon game boy game yeah so yeah. again like you you go back to the 80s and 90s you know 2000s like fidelity increased yeah. so over time we'll, we'll get to these new places just like just like cities you know yeah it's like you're yeah, it's, it's like Europe, Europe has this brain drain because everybody wants to move to America now, you know, 
eventually America will have a brain drain. People will move to other places. Yeah. What, what do you think about the idea of? Uh, I think this is this was brought up to my attention. I listened to the Bology podcast uh, with. Uh, I think it was I think Sam Harris interviewed him. He's done a couple of podcasts where he talks about this. He's a very similar thesis on, on different podcasts. But one of them is that there'll be the way that cities operate now is if you think about it, they provide uh, the city mun municipality or the local government will provide services. They provide a, a police force, you know, to, so you can call and keep people safe. They provide a infrastructure service, so they're like building roads, they're repairing roads, they're providing uh, fire services. You know, these are these are basic services that are layered on and you pay a price for them. You pay your taxes. But if you were he, his argument, which I've, the more I've researched and thought about it, the more I agree with it is that even in existing cities, you can offer a subscription model where people can opt in to a secondary, uh, uh, private privatized. It could even be a nonprofit, but it's, you're paying an amount, maybe you pay $250 a month and then you get a, private police force, a private fire department, a private um, yeah. uh, educational system. And these are layered on top of the existing municipalities, but they're so much more efficient. It's all web-based. It's all fluid, just how you would imagine building it from scratch, that it's it's so much more efficient that you're, you're gaining in traction over the existing municipalities, so much so that you eventually have a critical mass of people on the subscription using those services that you then – get voted into the existing mayor office and then you just adopt that system into the existing system that to me is yeah. logical i don't think it's even come close to happening yet but the the building blocks are there the simpler model to me would be get a bunch of people who uh, can work remotely and just l start a new city entirely just design it from yeah. scratch and i think that's happening in yeah. Uh, outside of Phoenix, there's a, an area that's happening. I forget the name of it, but it's c really compelling, yeah. right? Because now so much value, so much of people's effort, productivity is created online. And there's so many different ways that people want to live in real life. You know, it doesn't have to be built yeah. with cars. It can be built with scooters or e-bikes. It can be, you know, you can yeah. redesign just about everything. And we're, we're at that point where if everything can be redesigned and be two or three times more efficient and different and compelling from a, an actual experience of living, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I could see yeah, a company totally. saying, I yeah. could even see you guys saying, okay, let's go and raise, you know, not today, but we're going to put together a crowdfunding campaign of everyone who wants to live in this new city. Everyone, you know, minimum investment is 5k and then you get different all allotments based on how much you put in. And there's discounts the earlier you invest, you raise a couple hundred million dollars, and then you know you have an inf infrastructure layer that people can come, and it's like modulized. So there's yeah. new, you know, there's new places that people can live as the city expands. Yep. So full context, Balaji was our first investor, the, our first check-in, and uh, <clears throat> we're still very early, but this was his thesis for us, basically, uh, is that. Um, is basically charter cities, startup cities, uh, charter nations, all that stuff, but the network state, so to speak. So one of the ways that we think about it is like, I think really importantly, if you want to start a new city, a lot of people have been trying this, like a lot of people did it, tried it over the pandemic. A lot of people are thinking about it now. The problem is <laughs> people love New York. People love LA, people love SF, people love Portland. Why are they going to love your city? And I think what's important is that you, if you're a city builder, you either need to find a pain point with existing cities that is so bad, that is so strong that your city solves. It's a product, right? Like, do your users, oh, yeah. is it, do you, is it a, is it a, is it a, is it a, what, I forgot what that expression is. Is it, is it a painkiller or is it a vitamin? Right. All of the cities right now, all the city companies, the city building companies are vitamins right now, in my honest opinion, mm. because the cities suck. Like San Francisco is terrible, but guess what? There, there are hundreds and thousands of other cities that people would love to live in that are not San Francisco. New York and LA are by, by far the biggest beneficiaries of, you know, SF, you know, failing to be a, be a well, well-run city. Um, Miami, Austin. they're going to thrive. 
as well. My, yeah. Miami, Austin to a lesser de- degree, but like those two cities for sure, like they're th- absolutely thriving right now. And guess what? They're great cities. They have amazing things. You know, if you want, if you're, if you want to date, a lot of people don't talk about this. The dating market is really important for a city, right? If you want, young people are primarily the ones who are going to be mostly risk taking to move to a new city. You want to build a city, you better have, you know, attractive, smart, successful people there to, that are, that are single and date each other. By and large, most of the people who want to settle, resettle the world are, you know, rich white men. You know, it's not like it's not a specific, it's not a specific group. So the idea is that you do need a you do need a massive pain point. So Jews, hey, we've been on the run for thousands of years. We just endured one of the biggest genocides in human history. All of our all of our families were wiped out in Europe. We should get our own country. That is a big pain point. That is a pain point. That's why Israel exists, right? And I, that's also, I think, why there's so many Jewish people in the U.S. is that it was seen as a, a, a place you could relocate to and, and be safe, yeah. given the separation of church and state. Yeah. And also, very interestingly, that's all, also why Jewish people are incredibly well-connected, despite being mostly atheists in the U.S., is that it's a shared struggle, back to that kind of concept earlier. But so do yeah. you do you see the existing cities as just not having a big enough pain point <clears throat> like the whether yeah. it's the homelessness, the taxation, the policing, the I mean, educational system. I mean, these are the major parts of cities. They they don't seem to be on the positive trajectory. I mean, you're not going to pop up a city in a month. Uh, so if you look at the trajectory of cities maybe there's a cyclical nature to the development of cities, but San Francisco, I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard to find a bullish uh, thesis on how SF makes a big recovery, at least in the next 10, 15 years. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw I, yeah. yesterday, they just closed down five grocery stores in the city uh, where it's like, man, if you're living there and you're just trying to have an average, you know, middle-class life, what do you, how do you rationalize staying there? Yeah. Yeah. So really, in my mind, like the people you need to attract to a city are young people starting companies. Right. They're putting down roots. They have they have they were they're going to create a ton of GDP for your city. Um, and that's like the audience. That's the audience you need. And this is the argument for why launch has were really well positioned to be kind of a leader in this space, because you, you basically need people who are willing to uproot and like go and live somewhere random. If you want to start a new city, like the one outside of, um, you know, outside of Phoenix or, you know, even Wyoming, you know, parts of parts of Mediterranean Europe, like, you know, European governments are absolutely like, you know, foaming at the phony, like chomping at the bit to get tech talent to move to those cities, yeah. to move to their countries. And they're willing to make huge sacrifices on a governmental level to get these people to move. Well, it's not, you can't get people to move to say, Hey guys, like check out these, like, you know, favorable tax, uh, tax things. Cause then you just get a bunch of like crypto rich people who are, you know, tired and just want to like rest and vest. You don't want those people. Yeah. You want those people, you want, you want the people who are, who are, who are struggling, the people who are fighting to, to survive and building, trying to build massive, massive companies. And so that's why we're, that's why I, I'm like bullish on what we're doing right now, because it's like our, our community is largely startup founders in their twenties. Mm. Right. And, and they're, they're known to live, you know, they live in New York in the New York house and they come to LA and they'll go to these other locations. We have a pop-up in Miami right now. We're going to do one in Berlin. So we're kind of training our community, not only to like build amazing companies, but live anywhere. So in five years, when we say, Hey guys, we're going to do something different. I know you, I know you loved traveling around the world together, living in random cities around the world, having this nomadic lifestyle. We're going to settle and we're going to, we have, you know, done our, done our, you know, business development with this country and they're carving out a plot of land for us. And here's our crowd sale or, you know, our crowdfunding. So it's, you find that, yeah, that would be the compelling move. Not today, obviously, but at a certain, when you yeah. hit a critical mass. 
Yeah, mm. but it's but I think I think the challenge I think the challenge in startups a lot of people get wrong is they jump to the finish line instead of anticipating the steps you need to get there. So, Balaji's point actually is very it's really interesting. He he says, if you want to build a country, you don't just start out building a country, you build a city first, right? So Singapore, Hong Kong, you know all these all these city Rome cities became countries. And then if you want to start a city, you don't just start a city. You can't just say, hey, we're starting a city. Um, he, says, he says you can start a university. So you have Stanford and Palo Alto, UC Berkeley in, in, in the city of Berkeley, um, Ithaca, New York, Cornell, mm -hmm. um, all of that, right? And so then if you're like, okay, if you want to start a university, you don't just wake up and be like, okay, here's the School of Engineering. You have to start one college and you have to start one class. And so we are like launch house. We're architecting like a university before. Of course, the idea is to get to this, like, you know, national, you know, you know, UN recognition thing, you know, maybe down the line, I won't get too galaxy brain about it, but we're our near term objective is to become a, a university. That seems feasible. It seems like you, you're, yeah. you're on a logical trajectory to, Call yourself a university, whatever a university means, <clears throat> as we go forward. Uh, what's the experience yeah. like for people? So they are debating joining a launch house program or moving to a launch house. What's the what's the pitch? What's the proposition to people? Yeah, so <clears throat> it is. I guess uh, here's how the program works. It's four weeks. Um, it's in LA or New York right now. We're doing our metaverse location too soon. And the programs are usually open-ended, so it's just founders, or um, we're actually just launching uh, one very soon called Hack House. In January, we're calling it Hack House. And it's the uh, it's basically a launch house for engineers. So no expectation about starting a company. It's just a, a an independent, complementary community to be kind of part of our university, right? So like launch house is the School of Entrepreneurship, School of Business, whatever. Hack House is the School of Engineering. So next year, next starting in January, we have one month uh, residencies for engineers as well. So you're an engineer, you're a founder, you go and you live in one of these houses for one month. It's open ended. You spend all day doing whatever you are you want to be doing. We're very like goals and work oriented. We're not. It's not like this isn't a, a party house. It's like we're really, really explicit and everybody works really, really hard when, when they're here. Um, you know, we check in on goals every single week. Um, Do people then, people set their own goals or are there? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. at the beginning, yeah, at the beginning we have like a session where we, uh, we have like a kind of a goal setting thing where people share, here's what I want to accomplish. Here's what I need help with. Here's how I can help other people. Uh, and then every week we will check in on those goals. So, um, you know, it's it's usually th uh, three or four nights a week we have like programming. So one to three hours. It's usually like a bonding night. Very non kumbaya, like a you know an authentic, you know authentic session where you just like chat and get to know each other on a deeper level than you would on a Zoom call. And then uh, the other is like a higher profile fireside chat. So. We've had, you know, people like Justin Kahn, Andrew Chen, uh, Fred or some like, you know, a lot of big names in tech kind of coming through and doing these kind of like uh, one hour talks. And it's a, it's an it's a semi open open event. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of these will get live streamed to the rest of the community. Soon we just installed some really awesome cameras in both of our locations. Oh, cool. Um, That's fun. Yeah. Are there creators as well? So engineer, founder, is there a, like an influencer yeah. creator focus? Yeah. So, th so there will be, so obviously launch house, hack house, these are, is, is, these are not the only two houses we will be doing. We're going to be doing a handful of them, but just like a university, we're not going to do a hundred. Mm -hmm. We're going to do you know a small number of them because, uh, they, they, they will each have their own brands, their own identities, their own purpose. Um, they'll obviously be complimentary. They'll all be obviously be supporting each other. Um, we will be doing one for creators. We haven't done it quite yet because um, 
as we learned, it's really important to have focus in, in the early days of a startup and to, you know, basically expand into adjacent um, areas versus instead of very different areas. So for now, we have creators who are like, you know, pretty intimate members of our community. We have people coming over to our LA house all the time. People with like, you know, all of our events mostly have like at least a third to a half, you know, social media, you know, influencers at the events. So, you know, the Fred Ursum event was pretty quintessential. It was like 50% influencers. Bryce Hall was in the audience. He has like, you know, 20, 30 million on, on TikTok or Instagram. He's one of the most famous TikTokers. But the idea is to bring these two groups together because creators have something that really that founders deeply need and vice versa. Creators understand distribution. Yeah. They understand brand. They understand marketing. And what's really important in the world we're moving into for the for the founder world is that it's so easy to start a company these days. Stripe Atlas didn't exist ten years ago, right? AWS, like all oh, these yeah. services yeah. and so so what that means is there's more there's more competition. There are more people who are building the same thing. And so in any system where there's a ton of competition, brand and distribution matters a lot. So again, like any system where there's zero, like there's little product differentiation, AKA high competition, venture capital is a good example. There's money everywhere, a dollar is a dollar, but the reason you take one venture capital firm versus another is because of the brand that they have and because of their distribution and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I, I argue, argue that's, that's increasingly the case that, that, uh, venture capital firms, particularly seed stage firms are, it's very difficult to differentiate on the actual mechanics of what you do because you don't, you don't have a lot of input, you know, late stage funds can have analysts, they can have a bigger network to hire more senior executives. But if you're like a two person, three person, five person startup, you just don't, you don't have, you know, extreme hiring needs. You don't, you don't have any needs other than just capital. And so how do you decide what capital you need? It's who can help me, what capital can I bring on that helps me get to the next round of capital? It's usually the, the yeah. game, which is so like, let's go after yeah. A16Z, let's go after Sequoia, YC, Techstars. These are organizations specifically designed to help you get to the next round of funding because that's how they win. You know, yeah. they win if you get to the next round of funding. I went through the yeah. Techstars program in LA actually, and it was a similar kind of experience to Launch House in that we, it was about a month long and you are very close with everyone there. There's maybe, in this case, there were 30 people there, 12 companies. So an average of like two or three people per company. They have, ex, uh, they have mentors coming in you know, they, they're very, very, very regimented. Like it's start on this time, stop on this time. Everything was down to the minute, which I loved. I mean, it felt very efficient. Um, that kind of stringent start stop just allowed you to get so much more done. And then at the end at like, you know, 6, 7 PM, it's like, now we're going to do something social. So now everyone gets to know each other. There's like a presentation by one team. I found it really useful. They emphasize the raise hugely. So it was all about like raising money and getting your seed round, you know, closed. And so that's, it makes sense, you know, as a founder, you're, you're mostly, especially as a pre-seed founder, we actually went into that program having already raised 23 million. So we were a little bit different than other teams, but, um, but it was, it was I, my takeaway from that was there's so many different flavors of this. You know, you went through the, mm -hmm. um, on deck experience I saw, uh, I'm curious to ask about that experience. How, how do you feel that on deck differentiates itself and has been as successful as they have? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was an awesome experience. It was in the middle of the pandemic. It was my first kind of like time where I was able to kind of decide I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a founder. Um, so I think like one really positive piece of it is that it's kind of a low stakes way for people to like try on the founder hat. So tech stars, YC, not the case. No, right? you're all in. You have to, you're all in. You're, you're, you're quitting your job. Like you're doing all this stuff. What's important is that there are other people on different, 
different parts of the, the, the demand curve, they want to become a founder, but may need like a little bit more pushing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what's nice about uh, the on deck program is that it is large. Like they get they get uh, a lot of criticism because a lot of the folks in there are just not founders, right? A lot of people in the founder fellowship are literally not founders. They're, you know, somebody that was like, they're they're like Uber PMs that like you know are probably going to be Uber PMs for the rest of their their PMs for the rest of their life, but they just want to like say that they're a founder for a hot second and try it on and <laughs> uh -huh. you know try in the hat and be like look at well, look at me. But what's important about it is it it allows people like me to actually trend, make that transition a lot easier. And did you do that coming so, from Google? You were working as a PM at Google. I was a PM at Clearbit, which is a like a marketing tech startup. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's it's our position with uh, like the the reality with On Deck, Launch House, Reforge, YC, TechStars, uh, to a degree. This is the new Ivy League, and I think on I think On Deck, um, and Reforge and us are kind of one of the few the few companies that are actually viewing ourselves this way. So, you know, equity list accelerators are basically colleges. A college is an accelerator. Yeah. Think about it. So, yeah, you know? Techstars and YC have a similar model. They'll give you some, you know, 20 to 50K, somewhere in that range, take 6 or 7%. Yeah. What, what's, the, what's the ask on your side from people jumping into the Launch House program? Nothing. Nothing. So we intentionally don't ask uh, people for any equity or anything like that. Um, they pay us a, an a, a annual membership when they, with, if it's their first program, they say they pay for the program fee and then the annual membership. And what's ballpark? What are those? And I know I'm sure they vary, but is that like a couple of it, thousand or tens of thousands? It's, no, it's not in the tens of thousands. It's a couple of thousand. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the way to look at launch house is we're, we're a membership. Um, we're, we're a community, a membership based community. Um, we index on people, not companies. Uh, and we're, you know, vibes first and all that yeah. stuff. A lot of people wind up, wind up doing multiple programs. Um, we are kind of like working on ways to participate in like the upside of a lot of the companies that come through, but we're still a little early in that. Um, but yeah, the most important thing is that like, you know, we believe that the best founders in the world have options these days. It's just, it's just increasing, right? It's like, you know, the amount of capital in the market is so abundant. Uh, you know, it's easier to get connected with amazing VCs than ever. And uh, like the tools for building companies is, is way more, e way easier to find and information is abundant as well. So in this world, you basically wind up selecting out great founders. Um, if you require any sort of, if you, if basically any accelerator in my mind is like, it's like a boomer concept at this point, because <laughs> I like that just because, because great founders are going to be like, yo, like I can take this, I can take this pre-seed from a 16 Z or I can go through your accelerator and get 10 times worse terms. What do you want? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I want to go with that. I want to go with that founder. Like, I don't really, I don't really care, you know? Yeah. And if you treat every founder like that founder, then they become like that, you know? Yeah. Do you know if uh, Ace, I've, I haven't raised any money from A16Z. I haven't ever pitched them. Uh, but I did raise from Social Capital, and they had a pretty strong emphasis on connecting you with other founders in their in their portfolio. Um, so I yeah. got to connect with – I think all – Yeah. They, I mean increasingly more so. Even then, we raised them two, at two separate rounds. In the second round, they really pushed that more. Is that something you see more – funds doing where they're emphasizing the community of co portfolio companies yeah I, I mean every fund every i think every fund is is doing that is going to start doing this a lot more um you know it's it's competitive yeah it, it's like a competitive yeah. advantage if you're investing in amazing people and they like you then it's easy for you to you know it's now like communities are way more way more effective at solving problems than individuals full stop. Right. So the idea is that like another found, like if you have a hundred founders and then uh, Paul Graham or something like that, those hundred founders plus Paul Graham is going to, is going to be a way better network for you to have than just Paul Graham. 
so of course, a lot of VCs will be like moving in this direction, especially if, as as competition gets more fierce. Yeah, yeah, I have to believe that that's how YC sees himself is the the next tier of uh, Ivy League schools, Ivy League universities. Yeah, but but what's interesting is that they're not like they're not really architected for that. They like one another way to kind of frame what's happening is that there's this kind of like there are these 15 year chunks of the internet, which is like, you know, web one, web two, web three. And so you think about it, like the Silicon Valley basically changed for each of these chunks. So like with web one, it was like, you know, Palo Alto, Mountain View, boomers and Gen X, they're building like web infrastructure. Web two is like the application layer, right? You know, Uber, Airbnb, like, you know, all those, all those hot companies, even Coinbase to a degree, a mm-hmm. uh, web application. Stripe, yeah. Um, that was really YC's Stripe. heyday. YC's heyday. And the, the, the business, the, like, this, the technology business was very aligned to what, they, what their product was offering, which is like, hey, uh, young people, do you, you don't know how to start a company. You know, Stripe Atlas didn't exist. Come here, learn how to start a company. Hey, you don't know how to fundraise. Oh, like, you know, Twitter was, was barely getting started. You know what I mean? Uh, all this other, all this information wasn't abundant. Hey, come to YC, uh, and learn and, and meet all these people and all that stuff. Yeah. Get put on the track. Yeah. You know, now, now we have web three. It's, it's not SF anymore. As we were talking about, it's LA, New York, it's distributed, it's online. Um, it's young millennials and Gen Z, you know, that's the dominant entrepreneurial force, not old millennials anymore. Yeah. Old millennials are VCs now, and so they and it's crypto, so they they need a new product. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's so there's no borders anymore. You know, now you can easily work with people in five different countries. Do, do you feel like there's um, one of the things I've I haven't looked into the research on this, but I have a gut feeling this is the direction we go. Is that as as it becomes easier to start a company, harder to build one, more people start companies. We reach kind of saturation in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's like Instacart, I could get food. I could get everything I need to live comfortably. Airbnb, there's a bunch of competitors to them to rent out, trade your house, do all sorts of things with housing, food, connectivity, uh, renting cars, buying cars, you know, shift, Toro, get around. There's like, you know, so many different ways to buy, car, buy, fix everything you need for all of these basic layers, which are huge market opportunities, which is well-funded, successful companies that are reaching maturation. Now we're getting to a point where that, as those products and services are widely distributed, people feel more and more comfortable to get into the artistic domain like creating the creator economy explodes that that's happened a few years ago. Like cam, my brother started cameo and he's like telling me in the early days. And I was right with him when they came up with the idea that I, is there going to be enough creators out there? You know, I don't know if there's enough people that are, that are making a living doing this and you know, in hindsight, 2020, but even four years ago, it wasn't obvious that, that, I, that concept would work. I, I almost wonder if are people going to be, are we going to look at, you know, the way that you can create in in the digital world in a unique sense, not just like you're executing on a product roadmap to build some product to solve an explicit problem, but you're like creating a new kind of a new form of entertainment or educainment, educainment, entertainment. So some, yeah. some blend yeah. of that. And I, 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 I wonder if that's the shift we make as a society. Almost like, you know, you and I are not slinging axes like probably our great grandparents were or doing hard labor. <laughs> and I wonder if the idea of being a founder eventually becomes, you know, by analogy, similar to that, where it's like, oh, man, you used to like work to solve problems. Like now we're just here <laughs> fucking around and making <laughs> making all sorts of crazy. Yeah, art. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's, yeah. that's too utopian and we're just forever going to have problems. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, like, there's this, I, I feel like every generation has this discussion about technology, where like, oh, like, you know, electricity will make it so we don't have to work anymore, or something like that. There's this great, there's this great image, uh, I think, like, Benedict Evans tweeted it out a while ago. And it shows this room full of like, men in suits working at these desks, and their their desks are perfectly aligned in this grid. And there are like hundreds of them. And Benedict Evans, the, the, the caption or something, is, it says, this is one Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. And then your brain explodes because you're like, oh, my God, like, 
all these people lost their jobs. But then you think about it, you're like, wow, how many, there must be that many or more people that use Excel, right? So it's, it's basically like, you know, <laughs> the humans just get better at, be at better at better at like doing stuff. And we're able to kind of do, you know, many more jobs with, for, with one person. Yeah. One, one, one totally agree. Labor. I mean, my, my yeah. major pet peeve yeah. on this topic is I just moved to Portland and uh, I was, as we were talking pre-show and in Portland and New Jersey, I just found out, I go to the gas station, I pull in, we're renting a car and I get out of the car and this guy comes out. He's like, Oh no, 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 don't trust the gas. You can't pump your own gas in Portland and New Jersey. It's illegal to oh, pump yeah, your own yeah, gas. Yeah, you have yeah. to have someone else do it. And yeah. I, I was like, why on earth would we still have this rule? And a huge part of it is pre preserving jobs, which it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, man, yeah. that's not a good sign if that's yeah. the motivation. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm i bullish on this kind of like play to earn kind of world where like, I don't know if you're following like Axie Infinity and like, uh, I don't know, the, the, the sheep and farmers stuff happening lately. Where, no, what's that? Uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't followed it closely enough to talk intelligently about it, but basically like the world of gaming and the world of earning are, are converging. And so in the near future, playing games and uh, making money are gonna be synonymous. And arguably that's literally how life works anyways. So, um, you know, life is a game, as they say, like the internet just makes it more gamified. There's this, there's this really eerie, you know, interesting thought experiment of like, if you notice a lot of games like Farmville or whatever, they actually resemble work. Like why, like, why are these right. like business people, why are these business people like literally spending hours a day on Farmville farming? <laughs> when Dude, I used to, you know I used I mean? to play so many hours of roller coaster tycoon where I'm like managing, I'm yeah, like, okay, same. so I have yeah. to manage the city and buy this infrastructure and lay it down. And, and it's not that dissimilar. It kind of does. I have a one year old son and he, and all he does is look at stuff, try to take it apart destroy it and then put it back together. And yeah, that's yeah. fun. I mean, that's just baked into him hardwired. It's like, you, I look at him, I'm like, you're just running a program. Uh, it's very cute, but it's also just representative yeah. of what we're doing as adults too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I think there's like, I think there's like, what will technology enable versus what will humans always seek out regardless of what technology has enabled. So as an example, like there's this, there's the simulation theory, right? Elon Musk's, Elon Musk and like some philosophers before him, but he, he popularized it. Um, this idea that we're living in the simulation. And it's ironic because here we are in a simulation, building a simulation, right? The like metaverse, virtual reality, we're building a simulation. So what do we do when we build the simulate? When, what are we gonna do once we build the simulation? Well, you look at gaming, it's all work. It's all like farming and all this stuff. Holy shit. Like literally our ancestors were farmers. Our ancestors like Mesopotamia was like, you know, is Farmville Mesopotamia over here? Like, are we in this big fractal mess? Yeah. So that's the kind of, yeah, it keeps me up there's, at night. There's a great, there's a great book <laughs> called, uh, the endless loop, um, that I recommend. It's very similar to that. Uh, the infinite loop. I think it's called oh, as yeah. a, uh, it's a book, also a movie, but yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of circles back to the original conversation of religion where, how do you, how do you view the situation that's going on and, and your, your role in it? Like, I, I just can't get over the, the, the wildness that you're, you're born into, you know, Brett is just sitting there that of all the, all the trillions of people who have ever lived, it's just, you know, here you are just looking out of those two eyes and same, and everyone has the same perspective. And if you really contemplate that, it just, it hits you. You can't help, but you can't just claim, I, I don't even believe in atheists. I, I think it's almost like, um, I think if you really contemplate it, you can't choose nothing. You can say agnostic. You can say like, I really don't know. Yeah, I, I yeah. haven't gone deep, but to s yeah. to say that there's nothing is, uh, yeah. it's making a pretty factual yeah. claim on everything that's going on. And it, it, yeah. it's paradoxically very unsci it, unscientific. Yeah, no, exactly. Atheists are like literally as dogmatic as, as the most orthodox, you know, Catholics you can imagine. Yeah. Right. Cause like to, to be an atheist means you have to, 
have a strong belief in something. And my personal, I don't know, I studied like cognitive science in college and I took a bunch of like philosophy classes and science classes and computer science classes. And like what it all comes down to is that we don't know. Like it all, it's all probability. And anything that's up to probability means that there's a chance that, you know, what you think, what you perceive, what you experience isn't exactly how it is. And so if that's the case, then like, you know, the flying spaghetti monster may be, you know, maybe God, like God may not exist. God may be, you know, a, a, a white man with gray hair and sitting up in the clouds. It doesn't, you know, it's all, it's all possible. Uh, I mean, I, my, my only reaction to that, uh, that, that I find where I can't quite swallow that perspective is like psychedelics are an area that r releases the, um, the unknowing, like it, uh, I've had a couple experiences, psychedelic experiences, particularly with, um, ayahuasca where it's, it's like, it's like a technology that, uh, that elevates that words are, are so clumsy sometimes, but the, it, 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 it's not, there's no uncertainty in the experience. It's like as real as the experience is right now, that experience is there. And, uh, yeah. and, and it's difficult to like, take it back and, and use words to communicate all, all of everything. Yeah. But I think there's more, yeah. I think there's more to, I don't think science gets there, but I think the individual experience gets there. Um, yeah. Totally. Under the right context. Yeah, I've, 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 I've had such experiences. Yeah. They're super um, powerful. And now luckily they're becoming more legitimized, studied, researched, you know, approved legally. Like we're in Portland, they're doing a ton yeah. of, um, uh, psychedelic research, uh, all over the place. And it's like, that's yeah. a whole revolution in and of itself. Yeah. I mean, what were we were talking about in the beginning, I think it's like, there's this kind of like, uh, there's a, the, there's like a revolution in consciousness basically that's going to be brought about by psychedelics. It's brought about, brought about by interconnectivity of the internet. It's brought about by, um, you know, hopefully like financial empowerment through, you know, decentralized finance and these other crypto, you know, crypto protocols that allow people to, know have enough money to survive yeah day to day um so yeah that's what makes me for the future. and there'll always there'll be challenges along the way um yeah. where are you guys now in terms yeah. of can you run through how, maybe how many people have gone through the program uh how much you guys have raised and, and what you're looking for going forward yeah so we have had about 300 people come through the program like 14 ish i think 14 cohorts we started last september um, and, uh, wow. So you're, you're running them million. back to back basically. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. It's a treadmill. It's a treadmill. Uh, but, uh, we take, we, I'm like, we're on a two week break right now. We're probably only going to do about nine a year, uh, per location. But, um, uh, yeah. So we, we raised th $3 million back in April, May, April ish, something like that. Um, and, yeah, generally we look for, so again, like Launch House is one of two, you know, two schools, so to speak, that we have right now. Hack House is just launching. For Hack House, we're looking for just top engineers. So it's going to be our three founding cohorts, Hack House 1, Hack House 2, Hack House 3. We're looking for amazing engineers. Um, two of those cohorts are actually Web3 oriented. So we're looking for Web3 engineers or engineers who are interested in building in web three, no prior experience is necessary. You just have to be good. Um, and you have to be here to build, you know, the point of the point of launch house is to actually take action and, and do something and to build and put stuff out in the world. Cause, uh, you know, we kind of just believe the point of <laughs> the point of life, as we were talking about with this crazy philosophical stuff is that the point of life is the point of the point of being human is to create. And so, the people who create, the people who put stuff out, they push publish, they you know push the prod, whatever. <laughs> those are the ones who win. Um, those are the ones who who create a better future for everybody. Uh, and so those are the people that were. That's something we just, we just emphasize. So it's a place for top engineers to go and and build. And on the founder side, um, we're looking for good people. Actually, both good people. Mm. <laughs> we got to live with you, so we <laughs> we have to make sure. It's important for people to be good. Um, uh, we look for 
people who are ambitious, who are thoughtful, for hardworking, who have, uh, you know, smart ideas about how the future is going to happen. Ideally, they're working on a company that is also very exciting. All precede uh, or seed. We have had later stage founders come through, but we found that like it's just a better it's a better fit for earlier stage. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Awesome, man. Well, the site uh, launchhouse dot co, right? You can check yeah. out more info. Brett, this has been really fun, man. I love all the different topics we covered. Thanks again for jumping on today. Yeah, man. Crazy, craziest conversation I've had so far. Today. Awesome. <laughs> today. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, I hope you guys keep crushing, man. Best of luck and congrats on everything. Yeah, likewise. All right, man.